Hello, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. This Bible study is going to be on, is salvation for everybody? Now, if you've never read your Bible from cover to cover, you probably say, oh yeah, John 3.16. Well, let's read John 3.15, starting there. That whosoever believeth in him, who's him? Jesus. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So anybody that doesn't believe is condemned already. But that says that he that believeth on him is not condemned. Does that mean every living creature that believes in Jesus can be saved? Let's take a look. Well, let's take a look at James chapter 2. Those of you that have been listening to, to me for a while know, uh, James to me is like the book on everyday Christian living. I mean, that's, that's my opinion. I think everybody should read the book of James at least once a year. All right, uh, James chapter 2, verse 18. Now, this also kills the um, people that scream lordship salvation. James chapter 2, verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You see, what you do will be decided by what you believe. I mean, let's face it. If you love the Lord, you're going to be obedient to the Lord. That's just the way it is. You know, uh, what you do is proof of what you believe. Verse 19 Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. All right, so do the devils believe in God? Do they believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Are they saved? I don't think so. All right, in Mark chapter 1, let's start in verse 22. And they, the people, and they were astonished at his doctrine. Whose doctrine? The doctrine of Christ. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Now, the scribes were the people that would write down, they would copy the Bible. They would take the Bible and put it on parchment or what have you. They were the copyists of the Bible. Verse 23. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, that's the opposite of the Holy Spirit. An unclean spirit. This guy's, you could say, possessed of a devil. Possessed, you know, demon possession, right? And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Do these devils, or does this devil or devils, know who Christ is? Absolutely. 
I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. They believe in Jesus. They absolutely know who Jesus is, and they believe. Are they saved? Uh, no. Absolutely not. They, the, the fallen angels, have no offer of salvation. Now, how do we prove that from the Bible? Well, let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. I guess we'll start uh, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And who's the he? Christ. God became man. And if you don't believe me, read 1 Timothy 3.16. Ah, uh, we could do that real quick. Let's do that real quick. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16. You know, all these people that hate Paul say he's a false apostle. I mean, you know, he's got so many doctrines that just tie up everything in the Bible. Uh, and they'll always tell you, ah, oh, well, Paul changed the law. Actually, no, Jesus changed the law. So, you know, when they tell you Paul changed the law, no, I don't think so. All right, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy. See, this is not even controversial. This is a fact. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You see, people, that's the difference between true Christianity and many, many, many of the other religions. Many of the other religions teach that mankind can become God, but then they deny that God could become man. I mean, really, is anything too hard for God? <laughs> You know, what was the first lie in the Garden of Eden? I mean, Satan told Eve, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis chapter 3, didn't he? Ye shall be as gods. Oh yes, you as a human, you as a man or a woman, can become God. And yet these same people will deny that God became man, human flesh. They will deny that. That's the difference between Christianity and the rest of the religions. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Oh yeah. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, this is verse 14, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Oh yeah. Jesus took part of the same, flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death... Didn't Christ die on the cross? Oh, yeah. That through death he might destroy him. That's Satan. He might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Yep, we were in bondage to sin and death. And through the power of Christ were delivered from the fear of death through the lifetime, subject to the bondage of death and sin. Verse 16. For verily he, who's he? Christ. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. See, there's two ways of looking at this that I, that I know of. Okay, I could be wrong. I mean, I, I, no, I haven't figured it all out yet. When I have, I'll let you know. But until then, uh. 
All right, so here it says, he took not on him the nature of angels. One, you could say that Jesus didn't come as an angel. He didn't take on the nature of angels. He didn't become an angel. He took on flesh and blood. Okay, so Jesus didn't become an, uh, take on the nature of becoming an angel. But there's another way of looking on it. He took, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels for salvation. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now that's how I look at it. Jesus took on him our sin, our condemnation before God the Father Almighty, he took on him the nature not he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now does that sound like he took on the nature for the whole world or just the seed of Abraham? I think it's just Abraham and I think I'm going to show that to you as we go further on. Verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. See, Christ is our high priest. He was the sacrifice. He was a prophet. He was a, the high priest. And one day he's going to be the coming king. Be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. What is reconciliation? Let's say you did something stupid, like you stole from a family member, and they knew you stole from them. And later on, you know, your financial situation changed, or you felt bad about it, and, you know, maybe you got saved after that. Well, you know, you either return what you stole or you make payment, restitution. And then you say, hey, you know, I'm sorry for what I did. Let me pay you everything that I owe and my apologies, and I hope you'll accept it. And then if they accept your apology and you get back in the good graces, that's reconciliation. That's where, that's what being reconciled is. All right. So, in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his uh, you know, only begotten son, right? So, does that mean God loves the whole world? Well, let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. John tells us in his uh, letter, his, his epistle, he says, love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In John 15, 19, it says, Jesus says, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore, the world hateth you. Now, in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, and who's Jacob? Grandson of Abraham. His name was changed by the Lord himself to Israel. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. All right, so... Did, did, God, uh, did Jesus die for the whole world? Well, let's take a look. Now remember, 
Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not, right? I don't change. I've actually had people tell me that the God of the Old Testament was evil and cruel, and then all of a sudden it changes, and then by the New Testament we've got a different God. Huh? What? I mean, seriously, people teach this garbage. So let's go through Genesis chapter 17. God, this is what's called the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant. Now, what's a covenant? A covenant is like a contract. But the difference between a contract and a covenant is this. Uh, let's say I've got a car and you want to buy it and I want $2,000, and you only got a 1000 bucks. No problem. So I tell you, all right, I'll tell you what you do. You give me $1,000 down, give me, uh, you know, $100 a month for 10 months, that's $2,000, car's yours. No problem. That's a contract. You do A, I will do B. But a covenant is different. God says, I will do. Now, there's two, two, two different types of covenants. There's conditional covenants, and then there's unconditional covenants. God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham. In other words, I'm going to do this for you no matter what. There's no conditions on it. I'm going to do this for you. However, with Israel, when Israel came out of Egypt with uh, Moses... God made a conditional covenant with them. He says, if you keep my commandments, I'll bless you. Well, long story short, they didn't and God didn't. You know, God says, you do what I ask and I'll bless you. You don't do what I ask, I'm going to curse you and I'm going to make your life miserable. And that's... If you don't know what I'm talking about, read the Bible sometime. Uh, the Bible starts in Genesis, people. It doesn't start in Matthew. And I just love these people who say, well, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, you know, <laughs> they, don't read, they don't read the Old Testament, but they won't read the New Testament either. So what does that mean? I'm a New Testament Christian. So, all right, Genesis chapter 17. God's going to make an unconditional covenant with Abraham. Verse 1. Genesis 17 and verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, 99 years old, okay? The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And if you don't know it, Abraham was called the friend of God. How's that for a testimony? I'd love to have them tell me that, you know, God's my friend. Oh, boy. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Many nations. Where's all these many Jewish nations? Uh, it, you know, everybody keeps telling me the Jews are uh, of Abraham. And, and we're just a bunch of Gentiles grafted in, saved by grace. You know, they tell us that we're non-Jews, that we're not, we're not the seed of Abraham. Well, if, if, if the Jews are all of Abraham, where's all these Jewish nations? Where are they? Either their theology is screwed on backwards or God's a liar. Take your pick. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of these, and kings 
kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed, after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, for every, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And of course, that's part of the old covenant, which uh, Christ fulfilled, right? Uh, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's see. Verse 13, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with the money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Nations, plural. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? You know, how many 90-year-old women do you know that have children? Not too many, right? Uh, zero. Verse nine, uh, 18. Now listen. Uh, God had... Well, uh, Abraham, Abraham had uh, a child with Hagar, his uh, Sarah's handmaiden. Because Sarah was barren. I mean, here it is. She's 90 years old. She's waiting to have a kid and never didn't happen. So, you know, you, if you want to read that story, you can read uh, Genesis chapter 15 and 16, I guess, you know. So, let's see, verse 18. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now, you don't, maybe you don't know it, but Ishmael is... Uh, the Arabs claim that Ishmael is, many of them are related to Ishmael. Now, Hagar, his mother, was an Egyptian woman, and it wouldn't surprise me. But what did God, you know, what is God going to say about this? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So, let's hear the answer. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. See, God said, oh, not only are you going to have a kid, I'm, I've named him already. You don't even have to worry about that. I got the name. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. See, the covenant was going to be with Isaac. Verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. And I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. So is Ishmael going to be part of this covenant? Verse 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. 
And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Now, people, the covenant with, was with Isaac. God said he would bless Ishmael for Abraham's sake, but he was not the covenant seed. So let's take a look at Isaac, because God's going to reconfirm the covenant with Isaac. All right, uh, let's see. We're, we're going to probably make this two parts. Let's go to Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 24. Now, Isaac's getting ready. He, founds, he finds a wife, and he's going to have two sons. Uh, so Genesis 25, verse 24. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Yeah, it's funny. Um, all the so-called black Hebrews love to call us white people Esau. And uh, you're going to find out why. But uh, one day I'm going to do a probably a refutation of white people being Esau. And they'll, they'll say that, you know, here it is, they were twins. And they'll say, well, Esau was white. Well, uh, what are the chances that if you have twins that one's black and one's white, well, what's the chances of that? I mean, really? You know, chances, if you got twins and one's white, the other one's going to be white too. And then they'll say, well, with God, anything is possible. Yeah, it is possible. But where is that in scripture? I want you to show me and they can't. So, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So you heard it is Isaac 60 when these kids uh, grew. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. All right, this is going to be a really abridged version. Uh, in, let's see, Genesis 25 and verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage. So he was making some... Uh, I guess lentil stew. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Uh, Esau is Edom. That's what his descendants were called, his children. And it has reference to being red. Isn't it funny that all the communists, uh, what is their color? Red, like a, take a look at the old Soviet flag. It was red with a hammer and sickle. So let's go read, skip to verse 32. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. Well, I'm sorry. Let me, uh, let's, I may as well, I, I don't want to be accused of skipping around here. Verse 32, or 31. All right, verse uh, 31. All right, so Esau came from the field. He's hungry, and uh, he says, Feed me, I pray thee, with that red same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. See, the birthright was uh, the firstborn had what was called the blessing of God called the birthright. He was to get a double portion in the inheritance. And the reason for that being is it was the oldest son's responsibility to take care of his, uh, his father and mother until they died. So, you know, while everybody else is running off to college, uh, 
you know, getting married, running off, having a family. The oldest son has got to take care of the family. Therefore, he was given a double portion. And that wasn't just a physical thing from his family. It was a blessing from the Lord as well, the birthright. Okay? Now, Jacob's saying, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? In other words, what good is this birthright? You know, what good is God's blessing? I don't, I don't care about God's blessing. I, I'd rather have a bowl of beans right now. That's basically, that's, that's the Bob interp, that's the Bob version. Verse 33. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he sware unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob for a bowl of beans, people. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau hated the blessing of God. Can you imagine that? Esau despised his birthright. Now, in Genesis 36 and verse 2, I'm going to probably mispronounce these terribly, so forgive me. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibamah, the daughter of Anon, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. These were daughters of the Canaanites. If you don't know who the Canaanites are, I suggest you uh, take a look at my, uh, I got a, well, if you're listening to me on YouTube, which I'm still, as of December 2018, I'm still on YouTube, I've got a playlist, uh, The Sons of God. The angels that sinned. That explains who the Canaanites were. It has reference to Genesis 6. But uh, if you're listening to me on Bright Eon, I'm hoping to one day create a playlist there. They haven't done it yet. But I'll let you know a little secret. The, sh the uh, long story short is the Canaanites were the children of the fallen angels and humans. I know it's not a very popular doctrine and people will fight against it and say, oh, that's not true, that's not possible. Well, you know, the thing is, why did God destroy the earth in the flood? I mean, these people will tell you that believers and unbelievers got married and they had giants for children and then God wiped them all out in the flood of Noah. Does that make sense? Since when do believers and unbelievers getting married have giants for children? They don't. You know, the Canaanites people were bad, 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 bad. Abraham told Isaac, don't marry a daughter of the Canaanites. Isaac told Jacob, don't take for a wife the daughters of the Canaanites. What did Esau do? He took a daughter of the Canaanites and the Hittites, and the Hivites. Bad news. All right, so how does God feel about Esau, Edom? Obadiah 1.8 Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau? Now remember, Esau is Edom. Verse 9, And thy mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the, uh, of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Obadiah 1.18, And the house of Jacob shall be aflame. And the house of Joseph, I'm sorry, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. 
Now, does that sound like Esau is going to have salvation? And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And, of course, the blacks will say that this applies to whites. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, we, we, we black Hebrews, we're going to wipe out you whitey. We're going to kill all you whitey because God hates you. Uh, I don't know. Malachi. Let's go to Malachi. Matter of fact, Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Now remember, Jacob was Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, and I hated, hated Esau. And I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. What's a man's heritage? Uh, let's take a look real quick. In uh, Psalms 127, verse 3, it says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So children are your heritage. And God says, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. See, Esau knew not to marry the Canaanites, and he did it anyways. How about... Now remember, didn't we read that I am the Lord, I change not? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Didn't we read that? Oh yeah. How about Romans chapter 9 and verse 13, a New Testament witness. Paul writes, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, I know it's the King James translator said hated here, but really, that's not what it means. What it really means is God loved him less. See, God loved Jacob a lot, and he loved Esau less. That's what they'll tell you. Uh, really? All right, let's go to Proverbs chapter 6, uh, verse 16. These six things, these six, I'm sorry, these six things, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, boy, these six things doth the Lord hate. Oh no, it means he loves less. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, murder people. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. You're going to tell me that the Lord lo uh, loves these things less? No. It's the same word. This word, these six things doth the Lord hate, Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. What's an abomination? That's a sin that God really, really, really hates. You want to know what abominations are to the Lord? Sodomy is an abomination unto the Lord. Witchcraft is an abomination unto the Lord. You're going to tell me that the Lord loves these things less? It's the same word. Where, you know, where God says he hated Esau. God hates there's things God hates, people. Maybe, maybe we need to find out those things that God hates and not do it. Yeah. All right, let's uh, listen to this. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And they're not and they're not black. Let's go to verse 14. Hebrews 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men. I try. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 
And, and how do you get holiness? It's faith in Jesus Christ, being born again of the Spirit. That's how you see holiness. Without holiness, you're not going to see the Lord. And you're not going to get holiness by your own hands. That's for sure. Verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. And what is grace? Grace is unearned favor and forgiveness. That's what grace is. I didn't deserve God's grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. Uh-uh. I didn't deserve it. I know better than that. It doesn't, you know, grace is not something you earn. Uh, it's not something God owes you. It's just unearned favor. I mean, you know, that's what it is. Looking diligently, lest any man fall. I'm sorry, fail, fail. Oh, I'm sorry. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. He was rejected. Who rejected Esau? God did. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Crocodile tears. Oh yeah, he cried crocodile tears. But it wasn't through his love of God, you know, he didn't repent of the evil that he had done. You know, and, and another thing too, let's go back to verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Why was he called a fornicator? He married his wives. They were Canaanites. He was never supposed to marry them. That's why he was called a fornicator. That's that's that was not a, a marriage. Ah, oh, don't believe me? How about Genesis twenty-four verse three? And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Genesis twenty-four thirty-seven. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. It was a no-no, people. Now, let's take a look at one more thing. Genesis 36, 12. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. A-M-A-L-E-K. These were the sons of Eda, Esau's wife. So, in Exodus, now remember, Esau married into the Canaanites and God's, God doesn't love Esau. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 17. We're going to start, oh, I don't know, maybe... Now ah, we'll start in verse 13. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 13. And Joshua discomforted Amalek. Now this is Esau's grandson, okay? Or Esau's son. From, a, from the Canaanites. And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That doesn't sound too good, does it? And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war, war with Amalek from generation to generation. God is going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Didn't we read that Esau's going to be burned up? The house of Joseph will be a flame and fire, and Esau's going to be stubble and be burned up? Oh yeah, people. This does does this sound like Esau's got and his children are going to have salvation? I don't think so. Oh, you want to know who and which character in the New Testament was a descendant of Esau? Herod. You know, Herod, the King Herod, the one that uh, killed all the children in Bethlehem under, what, two or three years old? Yeah, according to Josephus, a Jewish historian, he said that he was of the house of Esau. When Jesus, when Pilate sent Jesus to, to Herod, Herod asked Jesus some questions, and Jesus didn't answer him a word nothing. Think about that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should read the Bible more often or at all. I mean, you know, think about it, people. Listen, you can get Alexander Scorby, S-C-O-U-R-B-Y, uh, the New Testament on CD for like $25 delivered and uh, listen to it in your car or at home. Or, you know, YouTube's got uh, for free. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine you're listening to the Bible on CD? Uh, you don't even have to sit down and read it. I mean, turn off your TV for th uh, one TV show and uh, uh, every day and, and spend 30 minutes studying the Word of God. You'd be surprised in a year how much knowledge you'd have. I mean, what would you rather watch, the filth on TV or godly knowledge? I mean, you know, I drove a truck for five years, and uh, we had cassettes back then. I mean, you're talking 20-something years ago, back when, uh, I guess, Clinton was president. And, uh, yeah, I'm getting old. And uh, I bought the entire Bible on cassette for, that was like $80, $85, and um, that's all I did for, you know, used to listen to the Bible when I was driving down the road working 10, 12 hours a day, you know? It's amazing how much stuff you learn. Uh, and plus, it was really wonderful. A lot of truck stops would have uh, chapels, Christian chapels, and they would have free sermons from local churches and what have you. And people had ministries uh, putting out good uh, Bible sermons, you know, it, it was amazing some of the stuff you'd learn. I mean, there was a lot of junk and garbage out there, but, you know, none of us has got it all right. I mean, I'm sure I'm I'm wrong on some things that I, you know, if I, when I find out, I, I'll repent and teach the truth and say, hey, I was wrong. But, um, you know, what can I tell you? So the Lord says he's the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. How long is that? Uh, yeah, how long is that? From generation to generation. That's a long time, people. All right, let's take up. In Numbers 24, verse 20, a prophet said, And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable, this par his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. Deuteronomy 25, 19. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out, blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Huh. Remember, uh, the Bible says that um, 
the Lord can blot your name out of the book of life. That's that's bad news, people. You know, I, I I'm not so much. I don't know. I, I it makes me wonder if the doctrine of once saved, always saved, eternal security is true. If God says He can blot your name out of the book of life, I mean, is it true? I mean, really? All right, so when Israel went into the land, in, in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 3, now go and smite Amalek. What is smite? It means to strike them down. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Kill them all. Men, women, babies, infants, all their animals. Wipe them out. Does that sound like they have salvation offered to them? It doesn't sound like it to me, does it? All right. And Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. What's raiment? Clothing. The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. All right, so. Uh, let's see. All right, let's go to one more. Exodus chapter 32. All right, this is when um, the people had Aaron make the golden calf. Moses was up on the mount getting the uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, let's see. Exodus 32, let's start verse 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold, gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Now, what is this book? The book of life, people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. You know, your name is written in the book of life, and God can blot it out. Does that sound like once saved, always saved, eternal security? No matter what you do, you, you can't be thrown away? Yeah, I don't know, man. I look at this and it it makes me think, you know, if God can blot your name out of the book of life, that's, I don't know. Verse 34. Therefore now go lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So... All right, so, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, everybody can be saved. Well, Satan and his angels, can they be saved? No. Was Ishmael made to have the covenant? No, Isaac was. Then Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Uh, God said he hated Esau, you know, and his grandson, Amalek, is going to be blotted out from under heaven. God's going to have war with him from generation to generation. Does that sound like the Amalekites and Esau's children could be saved? I don't think so. So can everybody be saved? Uh, do you ever wonder why the Arabs, if they are the Ishmaelites, the, the children of Ishmael through Abraham, why they don't hear the gospel, why they are into Islam, why they follow the Quran? Maybe it's because they're not part of the covenant. I, you know, that's what I get out of it. You know, can 
if you're not part of the covenant, can you be saved? I don't think so. I mean, the Canaanites, what about the Canaanites? All right, in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 21, it says, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness, holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day, what day? The day of the Lord. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So does that sound like the Canaanites are going to be given salvation and be able to be around? Doesn't sound like it. But then, you know, there's people who say, well, you know, Jesus changed his mind. You know, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. Uh, I am the Lord, I change not. Didn't we read that earlier? Yeah. In Matthew 10, 4, 10, 4, well, that's a CB reference for you trucker buddies out there. In Matthew 10, 4, it says, Simon the Canaanite. And then in Mark 3, 18, And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Canaanite. Now, does that mean that Simon was a Canaanite by blood? Or does that mean that Simon was a called a Canaanite because that's where he lived? Now, let's face it. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So was he a Bethlehemite? Uh, Jesus lived in Galilee. Jesus was uh, from Nazareth. He was called a Nazarene. So was Jesus a Galilean, a Nazarene, or a Bethlehem Bethlehemite? You know, Bethlehem and Nazareth are not the same places. So, you know... It kind of has, I think it, my opinion is Simon was not a Canaanite by blood. I think he just lived in the land of Canaan and he was called a Canaanite. You know, I'm a U.S. citizen. Right now I live in Florida. If I moved to Tennessee, wouldn't I be a Tennessean? I was born in Kentucky. Does that make me, am I a Kentuckian? I can hardly tell you anything about Kentucky. I mean, you know, when, when I was in the Army... We went to Fort Knox, Kentucky for basic training. And all the sergeants said, yeah, you know, you guys, you want to go on to, out to town, go with Bob here. He, he was born in Kentucky. He knows the area. And I was like, Sergeant, I, I, I don't know anything about Kentucky. I, you know, if we go to Miami, yeah, I can show you around. But, you know, I didn't know anything about Kentucky because I was like two years old when we moved to Miami. So, you know, uh, am I a Kentuckian? Am I a Floridian? I don't know. You know, so I don't think Simon was a Canaanite by blood. But there's people who will tell you that, well, now the Lord changed his mind and the Canaanites have salvation offered. I don't think so. So, but that's just my opinion. Uh, you could do a big study on the Canaanites if you want. So, all right, well, this is the end. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen.